Welcome to church. So happy to have you here. Let's worship and let's praise.
So as we, uh, as we sing that song, it's important to understand when it says that he won't fail. Um, if you're like me, we typically translate that to mean that he won't fail and that what I want to happen won't happen because he won't fail. Um, that's actually not what that means. So what God has promised is this. It's through the person of Jesus, sin has been defeated, death has been defeated. He promises to give us his Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of Christ, to join Jesus on his mission of reaching the entire world. And that one day he's coming back and he's gonna make all things new and there's gonna be a new heavens and new earth where those who trusted him will delight in him and one another for all of eternity and it won't be boring. God is never boring and we're not gonna float like you know babies in diapers, that's Hollywood. No, we're gonna have resurrected glorified bodies. And so that is going to happen just as way Jesus rose from the dead. Teenagers, it does not mean we won't face adversity. It does not mean that crazy, chaotic stuff won't happen in the world. So just by way of illustration, uh, my wife's granddad, who's no longer alive, was born in the early 1900s. So in his lifetime, he experienced um, a terrible influenza. He experienced World War I. He experienced the Great Depression, he experienced World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the 1960s, which was absolutely crazy, and then Desert Storm and 9-11, uh, and then eventually he passed away. So what I'm telling you is human history, since the dawn of history, is one of war and violence in conflict, that's why the Prince of Peace left heaven, came to this hellish earth and said this, but I tell you, bless those who persecute you and love your enemies. There would be no bombs flying if we loved our enemies. So this morning, I am praying for everyone in Israel to know Jesus. I'm praying for everyone in Iran to know Jesus, everyone in Russia to know Jesus, in North Korea and China and Fort Mill and Brazil and in the seats right here. Our allegiance is to Jesus alone. After America's gone, his kingdom will rule, his kingdom will reign. That's why we're here, to praise him. He is faithful, he is undeniable. His salvation will come. That's why we worship. That's why we're here. All right. So now when we sing that song, that's what we're saying, teenagers. Gosh, I wish I could just put you under my big huggy bear arms. By the way, my arms are nowhere near as strong as Jesus is. But if I told you, you know, bad things aren't going to happen, I'd be lying. But if I told you this, King Jesus will even work those bad things out. That was what was meant to break you. He will resurrect and it will remake you. So let's say it one more time. He won't fail. Let's let that be our prayer with just the voices. Shannon, lead us in that again, just the voices. Let's let this 
rise up as a fragrance to the nostrils of our Lord. You won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. Father, we believe that those words are true. Just it is true that you rose from the tomb. You destroyed death, you defeated sin, evil is on the run. We thank you for your grace and today we celebrate you and our hearts are open. We hand you our hurts, we hand you our confusion, we hand you our lives because only your hands are big enough to hold them. We pray this in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Can we give our music team a round of applause? All right, you may be seated. It's so good to see all your beautiful faces. Uh, one of the things that we do here at Transformation Church is we have a tradition of greeting people because it's a big step to walk into a big old building, sing songs you never sang before around people you don't know. So let's give it up to our first time guest. Thank you. And let's give it up to our guests that are watching online as well, especially our friends in the Philippines and Hawaii and South Africa. If you want to invite me to come preach, just let me know. Um, let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships. And to the TC family, it is so, so good to see everybody. So we're continuing our series called Grow By. Um, Following Jesus is not simply about going to heaven when you die. It's about God forming the life of Jesus within us. There's a word for that, and that word is discipleship. Teenagers, the word discipleship simply means a student or an apprentice. So we are students of Jesus. Jesus is the senior pastor of this church. He is the great shepherd that we're following. So Jesus, we're learning the rhythms of grace so that he can form his heart into us. Another word for it is called spiritual formation, meaning that God, the Holy Spirit, is forming us into the image of Christ. Into the image of Christ does not mean that all of a sudden you and I are going to look like a first century Palestinian Jewish man named Jesus. That's not what that means. Like you're going to wake up and go, wow, I got curly hair all of a sudden. Some of you are going to go, wow, I got hair. No. <laughs> At the resurrection, yes. What it means is his love, his passion, his power, and even his spiritual gifts begin to form in us so that the world will see him so that we'll have purpose and joy, so that people who don't know him can come to know him, so that generational brokenness in our families can be healed. So, so, so Jesus wants to overflow in our lives and through our lives. And let me park this right here. This is really important. And I'm going to talk to mom and dad first. Mom and dad. Your spiritual formation, your discipleship is of the utmost importance. Your kids are going to be caught the gospel more than they're taught the gospel by the way you order your life and treat each other in conflict. This isn't about memorizing scripture. Memorizing scripture is important, but the devil knows more scripture than all of us. It's about obeying the gospel and be transformed. Some of you right now, and how you argue and fight, you're bringing stuff that your grandmother, grandmother, and granddad did that you saw modeled, that they say saw modeled, and you're doing the same thing today. So your discipleship is really important because what you're doing is you're breaking generational dysfunction. So we're not playing games here. This is about truly transforming and blessing generations that aren't even born yet. It's about God doing a deeper work in us. Any men hate asking for directions even though you know you lost? Some of y'all here this morning because you got lost. And you're like, no, babe, I told you we're going to Transformation Church. She said, no, it was another, no, 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 that's where we're supposed to go. You got lost. Well, I'm not one of them dudes. 
I love asking for directions. And here's why. Because I don't have time. There's an amazing thing called Google. And it will answer all your questions. Vicky would be like, well, what do you think? I'm like, have you Googled it? (laughs) Well, since 2024, we have seen God grow our church in unprecedented and amazing and beautiful ways. And yeah, that's something to clap about, seriously. Uh, Okay, so let me let you enter my world really quick. You need to understand this. The Christian church in Europe and America is shrinking rapidly. The traffic jams you see at our church, the full house you see at our church, that's not normal. The average church size in America is 75 people. Don't take for granted what you're seeing the Lord do. And so when I say we're growing, I am grateful because most of the church in the West is not. It is rapidly shrinking, right? So that's why our mission to reach people is so, so important. But but yeah, so so I I love getting directions. And so I want to give you new people directions because you're like, okay, what do I do now? I've come for about a month. Some of y'all are dating us. And and now it's time to get a little bit more serious. In a minute, I'm going to drop that ring proposal on, you know what I'm saying? Got to put a f- ring on it. Uh, but, but, but here's some directions of how to get connected into the life of the church. First thing you got to do is go to Dougal. <laughs> go to Transformation Church website. Hit resource, our next steps, go to disciple-making culture, and you'll see this wonderful page that comes up, and as you peruse and go down disciple-making culture, what you're going to see is the five characteristics, which we're going through now, first steps, next steps, life steps. Say it with me on the count of three. One, two, three. First steps, next steps, life steps. So first steps, newcomers connect baptism after you've made a profession of faith. Uh, next steps is we, we get you connected. So understand this, Transformation Church is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And the weapons we use are love. So, um, you know, in my NFL days, there would be people who would wear our jerseys and they'd be in the stands, but they wasn't playing the game. Here at Transformation Church, we want everybody to play the game. You have a role and ministry and we'll help you get connected and it's for your good. Then we got life steps. So anything from small groups, short-term groups, um, finances, marriage, singlehood, mental health. So everything here for you to grow in Christ-likeness is present. And so my job is to let you know it's present, so unwrap the gift because it's not just about you and it's not just about me. But family, their dark powers did not want you and I to grow. And for those of you exploring who Christ is, they don't want you to come to know Christ. The dark powers, and when I say the dark powers, I mean the fallen angels who cannot touch God but want to and can touch you and I if we believe their lies. The dark powers want to deceive you into finding your identity outside of God himself. The only thing the dark powers can do, they can't read our minds, but they can implant thoughts, is the power of a lie. That's all they can do is get us to believe a lie. And they want us to believe that who we are, our identity is found on what we do or what happened to us. So let me give you an example. Teenagers, identity simply means this. Who am I? And why am I? Who am I and why am I? When you understand who you are and whose you are, it transforms the way you live. When you don't, you're always searching. And like that little band from Ireland that may be successful one day, you too, you still haven't found what you're looking for because your identity is found in things that can be taken away or lost. And here's the hardest thing. The dark powers know that, yeah, if if you do something evil and wicked, like, they kind of know, like, yeah, they're going to come to Christ because it's evil. But the hardest people to come to Christ is finding your identity in good things. 
For example, um, my dad did not go to any of my football games. How do you have a son that plays in the NFL and you go to no games? That's utterly ridiculous. So I decided when I become a dad, I'm not going to miss any of my kids' stuff. My daughter's cheerleading. I was a cheer dad. You know, uh, I miss five of my son's practices, not games. In the words of Allen Iverson, I'm talking about practice. <laughs> but a part of that, even though it was good, now watch this, it became bad. Because it was, I want to show I'm a good dad and I'm going to do this and I'm, do you see the problem? And when it's I, guess what? I'm in the stands and I'm, I'm nervous and, and I'm hard on my son and I'm trying to do this up because it's in my power. It's a good thing, but it became a bad thing because it's a God thing. And finally, in ninth grade, my wife was like, would you chill out? Derwin, he's six foot. You played in the NFL, I was Division I. He works hard. He's going to be fine. And he was. But I wasn't fine because I turned a good thing into a God thing. And so I began to say, you know what? My goal is not to give my son what I didn't have. My goal is to introduce my son to Jesus. You see the difference? So right now, right now, some of you are smothering your kids like I did, and it looks good on the outside, but on the inside, there is fear and idolatry. Listen, I don't care if you homeschool, whatever kind of school you do, that's between you and the Lord. What I care about is your heart. For some of us, you're doing this to your kids, not because they're bad kids, it's because you was a bad kid. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> don't, please don't let them think you always been Deacon Earl. <laughs> please, 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 don't let, please don't let your kids know that, 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 that you ain't always been uh, uh, who you are today. Now, I ain't saying tell all your business, but what I am saying is when they make a mistake, go, man, they ain't nowhere near what I did. They'll respect you more. They'll actually connect with your heart more when they see that Jesus changed you from something to this. Søren Kierkegaard, he's a Danish philosopher, one of my favorite dudes. He was what's called an existential philosopher. He was also a great Christian, and he dropped this gem right here. He said, sin, and by the way, sin means to miss the mark. The mark of humanity is Jesus. We all miss the mark, and here's one of the reasons why. Sin is building your identity on anything but God. And your identity is this. What gives me ultimate love? What gives me identity? What gives me worth? And what gives me purpose? And so what you and I do is instead of worshiping the uncreated creator, we take all of his gifts and we worship him. You're like, what you talking about, pastor? You don't know me. I bet if you and I wrote down all of your prayers throughout the week, how many of them would be, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this? Why is this when people pray, they always be like, well, Lord, tell those people to stop hating on me. Do you ever ask God to help you stop being a jerk? <laughs> stop being selfish? Stop being greedy? It, 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 it's funny how we want God to do something always as some, somebody else. Whenever I do marital counseling, first thing I say is, what can you change in your marriage? Well, let me tell you what they did. Uh, let me speak English now. What can you change? Well, they, and I'm like, come back at another time when you're ready for healing, actually, because you're not right right now. God going to do what he's going to do in them. Let God do what he's going to do in you, because whether if you get back with them or not, you need to be a healthy you. Oh, y'all ain't picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> All right, here we go. John 10.10, 10, let's root this. The thief, this is the dark powers, teenagers and young adults and those of you not in Christ yet. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And the way he does it is through lies. The scene of the crime is your Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
This is speaking of intimacy and relationship with him. And how does he give us life to the full? This reality called worship. And teenagers and young adults, worship is building your identity on Christ himself. Worship music is wonderful. And by the way, music is God's idea. I love Michael Jackson. <laughs> but it was not his idea. I love James Brown, get on up, uh. but it wasn't his idea. I love Sugar Hill Gang, hotel, motel. Uh, stop, stop, stop. We can't do the next lyric. Can't do it. Those are unsaved lyrics. <laughs> music is God's idea. But music is, the only, is not the only aspect of worship. The greatest worship song you and I can sing is a life of obedience to Jesus because we adore him and we love him. And the way we adore him and love him and say, Jesus is, all of my life is built on you, not my failures, not my pain, not my past. It's built on you and you alone. And it is a lifetime journey of getting to know him intimacy into me you see. And the beauty about Jesus is when you think you've seen all of him, you're only scratching the surface of his beauty. So how do we love ourselves correctly? First, we need a definition. To love yourself correctly is to see yourself as God sees you in Christ Jesus. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that a little bit more, but I want to tease this out some. To love yourself correctly is to see yourself as God sees you. Right now, many of us see ourselves, even followers of Christ, we don't see ourselves as God sees us. We see ourselves as the words spoken over us. And some of those words we're not even words that started with your parents. It may have started with your great, great grandparents and it just kept coming down, kept coming down. For some of you women, you automatically look in the mirror and go, I'm so fat because when you went through that pudgy stage in like sixth, seventh grade, your mom went, girl, you're getting fat. And so you can be in the best shape of your life and go, I'm so fat. For some of you, you can have incredible accomplishments, but the only thing you hear is, why'd you get a C? For some of us, we were abused and we were manipulated and we thought, that's what you deserve. When I was, uh, I don't know, eight, nine, so there's been like 1980, 79, somewhere in there, we're watching the Houston Oilers with my granddad. A guy named Mike Renfro, white receiver, number 82, don't ask me how I remember that, I just do, caught a touchdown pass and they were talking about he's going to get a new contract. So in my Fruit of the Loon underwear, I ran and got the football, I wrote up a contract, and I handed it to my granddad. And, you know, he was a recovering alcoholic. I mean, he had gone through a lot. And he looked at me, and he took the paper, and he threw it down and says, people like you just dream. I'm like nine years old. So you best believe when I sign one NFL contract, two NFL contracts, three NFL contracts, four NFL contracts, I was like, dreams do come true. Now, I never told him that. I never used that against him. My point is this. There's no joy in revenge. There's no joy in, see, I told you I could do it. The man was hurt. He was a recovering alcoholic. Even, even, even as a 70-year-old, he would cry to me about losing his mom and dad. And he had to grow up with his mean granddad, ran to the army at 18. The man was hurting. So give people a break. Everybody's going through something. That's why we need a savior. So we're going to learn how to see ourselves as the way God sees us because the way we see ourselves is the way we treat ourselves, but it also makes us hopeful for other people. So watch this. How do we love ourselves correctly as we grow 
into the image of Christ. Embrace the gift of being united to King Jesus. Embrace the gift of being united to him or in him. What does that mean? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. This is the only verse we're going to marinate in, and it says this, God has united us with Christ Jesus. What in the world does that mean? Um, I was searching for an illustration for days, and it was wearing me out. And at the nine o'clock, I got it, so I'm gonna give it to you. You may or may not like it, it helped me. This is a PC that can also be a tablet. And yes, yellow is my favorite color. When I'm on airplanes, they go, excuse me, sir, we're getting ready to land. Can you please put up your PC? And I go, <laughs> it's a tablet. <laughs> 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 I'll be petty, y'all. I'll be so petty with it. Like it's, it's a tablet. <laughs> so inside this is the software, and outside is the hardware. When you and I come to Jesus, we are united to him, and his software is in us, even though we're encased in the old hardware. And one day in the new heavens and new earth, when Jesus returns, the new hardware is going to go with our software, but because our software keeps us online with him, what's true about him is true about us despite what the hardware looks like. You and I are united to King Jesus. And that means that everything that's true about Jesus it's true about us. The way the Father loves Jesus, he loves us. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. What's taking place here? Paul is writing to Corinth, so Greek philosophy is important. The word wisdom means Sophia. It means the skill to live life. And Paul is saying, listen, because you're united to Christ, Jesus lived the wisest, sinless life ever and it's attributed to you. Jesus dying on a cross is epic, but it would mean nothing if he didn't live a sinless life. Jesus didn't just live a sinless life just to live a sinless life. Jesus lived a sinless life to show that he's the Lamb of God, but also to present you to his Father as though you lived that life. Guys, it's so unfair. Um, following Jesus is not for the proud. It is for those who've come to the end of themselves and go, I need someone else to do this for me. I need, I need someone else to do this for me. And so Jesus goes, son, daughter, you're with me, and everything that's true about me is true about you. When I took the final exam, I scored 100, you scored 100. What's in my bank account is in your bank account. The way my father feels about me, the father feels about you. Why? I don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's amazing. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he frees us from sin. So check this out. How do we love ourselves correctly? We embrace Jesus' righteousness as our own. The word righteousness is a beautiful Hebrew word, and it simply means this, right relationship with God and right relationship with people, or another way to say it is this way, God's means of bringing heaven to earth, God's means of healing the world, God's means for humanity is for us to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Can you imagine for just three minutes only, if all the leaders in Israel love God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength and love their neighbors and love themselves, if the leaders of Hamas love God with all their heart, mind, strength and love their neighbors and love themselves, if Russia, and just multiply that in America, all throughout the world are, are petty, childish political candidates that we wouldn't even allow our kids to talk like. Imagine if they did that. For just three minutes, what would happen? Healing in heaven will come to you and to me and the rest of the world. That's what the righteousness of God is. That's God's way of healing the world. And he sends Jesus, and for 33 years, he lives that life saying, this is what God's righteousness looks like. This is what you were created for. And I'm going to go to the cross and give you my righteousness because you can't do it. 
As a matter of fact, let's look at the text. God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right, righteous with God. He made us pure and holy and freed us from sin. So the righteousness of God means this. Number one, all the charges against you and I in the courtroom of heaven have been dropped. You and I could not live righteous, and God has to deal with our sin. People who go, well, why would God do that? Let me ask you a question. What would you do if somebody broke in your house and tore it up? You would want justice, right? But when God goes, I created an earth, and all y'all do is pollute it. You enslave each other. You kill each other. You're greedy. You do human trafficking. Oh, but if I want to have justice, I'm a bad guy. But y'all kill each other all the time. God is the only one who has pure justice, which flows out of love. But what's amazing, he goes, all that's true, but I'm going to send Jesus to take your place and be the righteousness that you could never, ever be. Watch this. Charges have been dropped. Not only were forgiven, charges forgiven and forgotten, but then God wipes our sake clean and he goes, and I'm going to treat you as though you lived the righteousness of God personally. So therefore, you're fully pleasing to God, not based on what you've done, but based on what Christ has done. Matter of fact, let's wash ourselves in the scripture. Listen to this now. God made him Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. You want to know who killed Jesus? I did. You did. And it was love that held him on the cross. It was his blood that made us righteous. Why did he do it? So that in him, there's the word union life, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let me lose my mind for a moment. You will never be any more righteous than you are the moment that you say yes to Jesus. God is not impressed with my preaching. He's not impressed with my parenting. He's not impressed with anything about me. He is only impressed with King Jesus. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our life. Jesus is our boast. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Guys, I've been saying this for 14 years. I get concerned when I hear Christians not talking about Jesus. I'm like, do you know him? Like, like, like you, you talking about what you do or don't do. What, what, that, what that got to do with anything? The more you're soaked in him, the more your life changes. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Romans 8.1 so now, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Listen, you may have been sexually abused and told you're no good. The people who hurt you, not only hurt you physically, but emotionally. Maybe you were abandoned by your parents and you feel like you're no good. Maybe you failed, whatever. But here's the thing. The more you and I think about ourselves and what we didn't do or don't do, the more miserable we're going to be. Can I say this so lovingly? The reason why we say upward, inward, outward is because if you stay inward, you're going to be broken and miserable. Stop worshiping yourself. Worshiping yourself is going, this happened to me, and they did this to me, and I did this, and I did this. Can I say this lovingly? Shut up. And start preaching over yourself. There is no condemnation to those who belong to Jesus. For some of you teenagers, you feel unseen, you feel lonely, like no one notices, and you know what? That may be true. And even if they saw you, and even if they noticed you, it still wouldn't be enough because you were created for only one to satisfy you. It's not your mama, it's not your daddy, it's not your boyfriend, it's not your girlfriend, it is King Jesus. You are for his eyes only, and so am I. You belong to him. How do we love ourselves correctly? We embrace Jesus' purity and holiness as our, own, as our own. God has united us. Now, notice the, the, the beautiful thing here. Just like an apple falling from an apple tree, it has to be united. So we're united to Christ, which leads to he lived a wise life for us. 
He made us righteous, and now he makes us pure and holy. This isn't for everybody, but this is for some of us. Uh, Some of us have lived a very sexually promiscuous life, and it's just eaten you alive. Maybe maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you've paid for an abortion. That child is with the Lord, but that guilt and condemnation is still with you. I want you to know that the blood of Jesus has washed you clean. Jesus isn't a halfway washer. Men, you know how we do when we want to do the favor, like, hey, uh, babe, I'll do the laundry, and then the clothes still be dirty after we do it. (laughs) Jesus don't wash us like that. The detergent in his blood cleans. The fabric softener in his blood softens our hearts. He has made you clean and pure. And every time you remember what you did, he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. I've washed it away. It is gone. So you don't have to think about it anymore because I don't. And the word holy means that that he sets us apart and says, you're mine, that there's a sacredness about us. If you follow Jesus, the spirit of God, God lives in you. There is a sacredness in you. One of the greatest tools of the enemy is to get you to hate yourself because things you don't appreciate, you treat like crap. But when you begin to go, wait, 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 I'm pure, I'm I'm holy. And you begin to see what God sees. And then you begin to see the world so differently. I say this every week. I'm going to say it again. Guys, I'm a compulsive stutterer. What's a compulsive stutterer doing up here? Guys, I didn't grow to church. I didn't own my own Bible until I was like 26. How does that happen? The first wedding I went to was my own at 21. My first sex talk was don't get anybody pregnant. How does that happen? God goes, I'm going to wash you pure. I'm going to change your mind. I'm going to make you holy. I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. And all you got to do is trust me. It's not something you work for or earn for. It's a gift that we receive. And then lastly, he frees us from sin. So it's embrace the price Jesus paid for you. Embrace the price Jesus paid for you. God has united us with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. That is the word redemption. In the ancient Near East, thousands of years ago, that word was used often because slavery was a normal part of the world. And so when the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt, he calls a man by the name of Moses. And he's like, Moses, I see my people, the Israelites, and I'm going to set them free. And Moses was like flavor flave. Yeah, boy. He had a big old giant clock on and everything. And um, <laughs> just kidding, y'all. And, uh, but then he goes, I'm going to use you to go set them free. So eventually God sets the children of Israel free through what's called the Passover. The blood of an unblemished lamb goat was placed over the door of every Israelite's home. And an angel of death passed by. The firstborn in all of Egypt died because the Pharaoh and his sin All of God's people are set free. That's called redemption. Now in the New Testament, the blood is not over a door. The blood was on a cross, and now it's on you. Here's a question. How much are you worth to God that he would spend the greatest treasure in heaven to buy your freedom. I think about that a lot. People go, Pastor, okay, so, so, how do you grow in your faith? I go, worship, connect, serve, give, and invite. They're like, no, no, what's your secret sauce? I read the Bible, worship, I connect in small group, I serve through my gifts, I give generously, and I live an inviting life to reach folks, but at the heartbeat of all that is worship, and the worship is this. I cannot believe God would love me like this. 
I cannot believe he would forgive me. I cannot believe he would make me holy and pure. Can I say this? Some of you have got to get over yourselves. The reason why you're not growing, you know the Bible like crazy and mean as a rattlesnake. You know why? Because you're depending upon yourself. Never forget this. Jesus gave his life for us to give his life to us, to live his life through us. What is there to boast about other than King Jesus has done it all and has paid it all and is worthy of all? But you keep playing the tape recorder about yourself. Our worship team is going to lead us in a song. It's a part of the message. And when they come back out, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then we're going to go into communion.
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you won the battle on our behalf, that the words spoken over us, the pain inflicted upon us, the pain that we've inflicted has been outdone by you. Because we are united to you. Not only is everything that we've ever done wrong, dismissed, forgotten, but we're also declared righteous. Not only we declared righteous, we've been bought with a high price that tells us our worth. We have a, a new power and a new strength. The one who rose from the dead has risen to live in us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Right now in this moment, I believe that there are many watching and I believe that there are many right now saying, hey, pastor, um, I want to know Jesus. Something's happening in my heart and I'm ready to follow him. Listen, that's the Holy Spirit calling your name. Today is the day you stop, stop playing games and say, Jesus, here's my life. I want your righteousness. Will you take my sin? I want to be united to you. I want to be pure and holy. I'm ready to receive all that you have for me. In the silence of your heart, say this to Jesus. He's here. Prayer is a bridge that reaches the throne room of God and applies the work of Christ to you. So right here, right now, say this in the silence of your heart. Today, King Jesus, I receive the sinless life you live for me. Today, King Jesus, I believe that on that cross, it should have been me, but it was you. And I believe that your blood not only forgives me, I believe that your blood not only forgets my sin, I believe that your blood also makes me righteous. It makes me pure and holy. And on the third day, you rose again to defeat death, but also to live your life in me for all eternity. And I say yes to you. I say yes to your kingdom. I say yes to you, King Jesus. And God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give God a round of applause. You may be seated. Uh, before we move into our soul tattoo and action step, our hospitality team uh, gave you a little handout here. And I encourage you to do these and save these and study them throughout the year. Also, what's going on at TC. But of extreme importance right now is the connection card. Have you prayed to receive Christ or renewed your faith in Christ? Uh, I want you to check on this. I prayed to receive Christ. I renewed my faith in Christ. If you haven't been baptized, check. I want to be baptized. If you're a first time guest, uh, make sure you give it to our team at the uh, first guest area. For everybody else, please place them in the buckets as you leave in a few moments. Um, but this is really important to us, and here's why. If Jesus paid that much for you, then that means you're valuable. And if you're valuable to him, you're valuable to us, and we want to shepherd you in this new life in Christ. All right? So our soul tattoo is what's the big idea to think about throughout the week? The big idea is this, love yourself correctly. So as you're driving to work, listen to the sermon. As you're working out, listen to the sermon. Share it with your friends. Work through the study questions. Let these truths wash over you. I get you for an hour and five minutes and CNN and Fox and Instagram has you all the rest of the time. So you have to make a conscious effort to go, I'm gonna renew my mind with the truth. So love yourself correctly. And our action step is we're gonna receive the Lord's Supper today. If you come from a Catholic or Anglican background, you may know it as Eucharist, and that just means Thanksgiving. You may know it as communion. What we say here most of the time is the Lord's Supper. And what it is, it is remembering what Jesus has done. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was with his disciples on Passover weekend. It was the last time he would share this meal with them. And he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. That bread reminded those Jewish disciples of the children of Israel when they were in slavery in e e Egypt and their bread could not leaven, so it's unleavened bread because when God rescued them, it happened fast. Salvation happens fast. 
Jesus said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And it reminds them of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, where one day a year, all of Israel's sins are forgiven through the shedding of blood of an unblemished lamb. But it's also a remembrance of Passover when the blood was over the door and the children of Israel set free. Well, the blood now is over you. So in this meal is a symbol of what it means to follow Christ. We follow the one who set us free from sin, death, and evil. We follow the one who makes us holy, pure, and forgiven, and righteous. And we follow him not at a distance, but being united to him, so much so that our whole history has been rewritten in the ink pen of God's grace. So when we receive this, we're standing in 2,000 years of history from around the world of Christians remembering the greatest story that's ever been told. So, Jesus and his disciples had these fancy cups too. (laughs) Pull the bottom and let's all pull out the bread. And we're going to receive the elements together. Jesus took bread and broke it and he says, this is my body broken for you. Family, let us receive the broken body of King Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then he took wine and he poured it out and said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Brothers and sisters, there's power in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. Let us receive the blood of King Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice, the shedding of your blood and the raising from the dead. The cross is still bloody and the tomb is still empty, so our lives don't have to be. Guilt and shame and words spoken over us have been renounced today and we announce that we are new creations. We are loved. There is no condemnation. We are righteous. We belong to you. We pray this in King Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Can you welcome Pastor Paul? All right, what a beautiful morning of living a life of worship, the communion, Um, really understanding what it means to have our identity in Christ. I really encourage you to marinate on this message and listen to it over and over again as well. To our first time guests, thank you so much for being here with us today. I trust that this service was a gift to you. For those of you that are in the building, we wanna encourage you to take your connection card that Pastor Derwin showed you, fill that out, or go to the QR code in the seat back in front of you, click on that, and once you've done that in the end of the service, go to the lobby to the next steps area where you see the balloons, and we have our welcome team there that they have a special gift for you, and that's a copy of Pastor Derwin's book, The Good Life, and that's our way of saying thank you for joining us. For those of you who are online, Thank you as well for joining us. And if this is your first time or you have a prayer request or want to know anything about our disciple making culture, click on the QR code there, fill that out. And we just want to know of your time with us. Again, thank you for being here that this is our time that we've worshiped through music. We've worshiped through the word. We worship through gathering. Hopefully we worship as we drive out the parking lot and we will worship through generosity. So let's thank you each one transformers for your faithfulness and giving because of your faithfulness lives are being transformed we're having an opportunity for people to see jesus even as we sang over all that we do you can give either at the boxes at the exit doors or online or through our app and so i just want to say thank you and let's thank god for generosity as well father we thank you for this opportunity that we can worship you through generosity Lord, that we can reflect your generosity even as you were generous to us through your son. You were generous to us by living in us and through us. Lord, may we reflect that the way we are generous with our finances, with our time, with our talents. 
Lord, bless each person who gives today. Bless each gift. And Lord, we pray that you would bless each life that is transformed because of it. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, I guess we're going to stand up. This is our time for our benediction. And our benediction is a good word. And our good word is that we point upward. And we love God completely, point inward, and to love ourselves correctly, even as we learn today, and outward for loving others compassionately. I point at you, you point at me, and I say, we say transformers, roll out. Why? Because this is just the? And now it's time to go play the? All right, on the count of three, one, two, three, upward, inward, outward, transformers, roll out. Have a great day.